Um, yes, my name is Alex Hurtle. Um, I'm the electrical controls engineer at, here at uh, Woods, Black Woods. Um, so we'll quickly go into um, a train session for electric motors. Uh, we'll be covering induction and EC motors. Um, so, okay, so without further ado, we'll get straight into it. So, so at the end of this session, you should be able to cover all these aspects. So the basis of electrical power, um, the principles of electric motors, the construction and operation of commercial motors, uh, and motor features, and things you need to consider while making selections on motors. <clears throat> Um, before we get into the motors themselves, it'd be worth going to and sort of like touch on and get yourself a foundation of electrical power knowledge. So first of all, we'll go into this and then we'll move on to motors after. So straight into here. So electricity. So just give you a quick, quick basics of it. So there's two two types of electricity. Um, there's there's DC direct current. And there's AC, alternating current. So DC essentially, yeah, direct current essentially just a, a flat, flat, um, flat line. Essentially, uh, current flowing in one direction. Uh, with alternating current, it's uh, flowing in both directions, so one direction and the other um, over, over time. And you can see it by those two scopes on your screen there. Um, doing like so. So these 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 scopes are basically current over over time. So that's just quick quick introduction of the two types. We'll delve in more detail on both as we go through. Um, so just quick introduction. So back on DC power. So DC power, where 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 does that come from? So to get a basic overview of where where it does come from, um, comes from the likes of batteries. Know, solar panels and sort of like DC power supply. So batteries, current flows in one direction, you've got positive and negative solar panels working in a similar way. And then you've got um, uh, sort of like uh, power adapters, like chargers for like mobile phones and um, uh, laptop chargers. They all work off the DC direct current. Um, moving on to AC current. So AC, we tend to get it from to its raw form, we tend to get that from a moving magnetic field in a call of wire. And there's either this this direction where you've got uh, moving linearly, linearly uh, like so, or you've got it rotating. So you can rotate a magnetic field or, uh, or move it in and out a call of wire, and essentially you can create um, a power like so. And as you can see by these meters, um, when a magnetic field is rotating one way, Comes flowing in one direction as it goes around to the other other way, or moving in the other direction, comes flowing in the opposite direction. And because of that, um, this is seen as uh, alternating current comes flowing in one direction, then the other. So that is essentially how, how, how does this relate really to every day? So essentially, this what you see here on the AC part is a very much a basic representation of how. Uh, generators and uh, power stations work. They seem to even wind turbines and, uh, and such. So, for example, with generators, um, they have a um, uh, basically an alternator, similar to what you have in your car, uh, which is a magnet in a coil, basically a, 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 like a, a stator with a coil of wire. Um, similar to this this image here, essentially, the magnet is rotated by the by the, the engine. Um, crane uh, supply power, like so, in, in color wire. Now, with the power station, it works in a similar way where it's got fuel, uh, it's burning fuel, in, in, or using fuel to, to heat up water, and the water steam um, essentially turns these large turbines. And these large turbines essentially then rotate uh, basically alternates in this similar way. Um, so we'll quickly go into the next slide, which will go into how um, this relates to sort of power lines and, uh, and and sort of your main supply towards uh, your businesses or even even homes. So <clears throat> here we've got the power station, not so, and here's a representation of 
essentially um, the Daimler or the, the thing producing the energy. So you've got this magnetic, uh, this uh, magnet rotating and these uh, cores of wire. Um, obviously, this has been rotating by for the first power station to be like a turbine, <clears throat> creating this power, which is, you can see there. So a bit more detail shown here. Yeah, so you create this 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 AC form here. And the reason there's three here is to relate to uh, uh, essentially three phases. So as you can see on this uh, diagram here, you've got one, two, three sets of um, coils, windings. And each one has the magnetic field essentially rotating by it. Um, at a different time or as per this, it'd be like 120 degrees away from each other. And it creates three, set, or you've got three sets of lines, which would be your three phases, and each one is creating a uh, um, oscillating AC current, essentially, um, power like so. <clears throat> and these will represent the, obviously, phase one, phase two, and phase three. So, in your in domestic homes, you tend to have the one live phase, which you've got down here. Um, this is obviously your live, and you've got your neutral and your ground and earth, which all come from the power station themselves. Uh, this is mainly for domestic. And then um, free phase, which is more widely used in sort of industrial purposes. Uh, the reason why we use free phase is to get them higher power for certain applications. Um, and essentially, is a very good setup um for for motors and we'll go into that in more detail later on um but also it's just just disclaim on this so the colors you see here brown black gray for the each phase uh, and the brown for the phase uh, for single phase that's that's and the blue and the green and the, that's all um to the local regulations here in the uk uh, to the most up-to-date regulations of wiring essentially um move on so just to give you a visual representation on now on uh, electrical characteristics characteristics essentially so we've got oh, the main things you need to know is is power and you've got voltage current and resistance those are the four things you probably need to uh, get a slight understanding of before we carry on and, and delve into the motors so here we've got a sort of visual illustration of these electrical characteristics so first one being voltage so voltage is the, the, the energy the amount of energy um, being pushed into the system so uh, for the for this representation you've got um, a solid bit of water um, the higher that water the higher the pressure and therefore, the higher, basically, you know, in, which in turn is, is increases the voltage, have an increased voltage. This in pressure will then essentially, in turn, create a flow of current. In turn of this representation, would be a flow of water. So increasing the pressure, increasing the voltage, will increase the amount of flow, be either electrons or in this uh, representation, the flow of water. Um, and then thirdly, we've got resistance. Now, resistance can be essentially the, the, the size of the piping or the size, even the size of the cable. You know, uh, the, the, the bigger the cable cross section area, the bigger the piping, the less resistance there is. Or even like when there's loads in the system, that creates resistance also. Now, all of this is relates to each other and you can get a, a, an equation from it. So it's only a, a small bit of the mathematics. And this, this equation is, not, is part of thing called Ohm's law. Um, now, as you can see here, um, just to sort of give a uh, representation of how this all relates. So voltage, increase the voltage, current, high, uh, the, the current will increase. If you uh, say increase the resistance, the, the current will reduce, being that obviously sort of self-explanatory via this system here. So uh, the smaller the pipe, the less flow there is. But yeah, if you increase the voltage, increase the pressure, the more current or the more flow can happen in the system itself. Um, and then from this, you can also get power. So power is related then to voltage and current. So the higher the voltage, um, 
and also the uh, current as well. So there's a relation between uh, voltage and current will give you the power. Right, so that's essentially um, just the basics of uh, electrical power. Now we're going to the principle of electrical motors. So first of all, we want to go in and talk about the um, electromagnetism just to, on the basics terms. So here we've got a battery uh, supplying current, uh, voltage to the current around a, a nail, essentially curled up around a nail. Um, and essentially this creates electric, uh, basically a, a magnetic field. So this current being a DC, um, being battery being DC, current's only flowing one direction. So if you curl it around a, a, a nail like so, you get a field fixed like so. Alternatively, we've got so AC current. So AC is uh, alternating. So doing the same sort of concepts, having this uh, uh, basically wire curled around a, a nail like so. Um, similar aspects of the DC to the battery at a certain points so of current flow in one direction. You've got a fixed magnetic field like this, but with an alternating current, the current also essentially flips the, into the other direction, which in turn flips the uh, magnetic field. And this continually happens as, as time goes on with this, uh, this waveform here. Um, we'll delve that, how that aspect is very beneficial into um, motors with, um, later on into this session. But first of all, we quickly have a touch on to motors using DC. <coughs> so here we've got a representation of a DC motor. So here you've got two permanent magnets. They are fixed on the stator. They're, they're fixed and they're not going to be rotating at all. Um, and then you've got these here, which is your brushes. These brushes are fixed as well. They're, they don't move, but they essentially touch this commutator, which is part of the rotor. And this is in turn also connected to the windings within the rotor itself. So DC current will flow in one direction, doesn't change. And as it's flowing in this direction, it causes a magnetic field in this coil, like so. And being that you've got these permanent magnets here, you've got these uh, opposing magnetic fields like so. Being that both is the same part on both sides, this repels and cause it to rotate. So as you see here, it starts rotating. But as it rotates, this commutator rotates as well so that um, the current is, is, is flowing in one direction as per the fixed position here. So the brushes don't move. So the current is always flowing in this direction. So north is always going to be here. When it's rotating, these brushes change where uh, the current is flowing in the windings, but the windings magnetic field will always be on this side like so, so north and south and it should be a continuous case of uh, um, rep uh, repelling essentially causing this to rotate and I suppose here's like another example showing the same sort of way and we've got a 3D version I suppose here as well sort of shows in more detail so here's your stator magnets and these are your fixed permanent magnets and then you've got the brushes here, and this is your rotating com commutator. Um, so what are, I suppose, what, yeah, what are the benefits of this sort of system? So the good thing about DC being it's a brushed, brushed motor, um, they tend to be small, cheap, and they're quite easy to speed control as well. Um, being that you can actually, all you need to do is um, change the voltage, increasing the current, um, through the windings and that but inc the increasing current will increase the uh, the strength of this magnetic field flux and therefore increases the, uh, uh, the repulsion and therefore the speed of the uh, uh, rotor itself. Um, although what are the drawbacks of such systems? So drawbacks are mainly mechanical wear when it comes to the brushes. So as you see here, this, these are the, your brushes. As you see, this one's a new one. This is a worn down one where it wears down over time. This sits on the, this commentator here. As you can see, it's been worn off onto the commentator. So there is need for 
uh, maintenance and, uh, due to this mechanical way you'll need to replace the brushes every so often um, but not only that because it's jumping from commentator to commentator on, on this system here um, you do get sparking like so I suppose how this relates to anything in uh, everyday somewhat everyday life we've got um, at home you probably have a, a, a drill of some sort potentially um, and a drill if you ever you know spun one up you probably notice there's been spark inside and they use essentially brushed it's basically a small brushed motor um, and it works in the same way so you can see here the spark and that's probably what you're seeing in, in your essentially handheld motor or drill I should say um, now drawback to having this happen is if you want this motor to be a, in a, in a environment where then like in, in an ATEX environment and an environment where there might be a, a lot of dust or, or expo even explosive gas some sort of uh, hazardous material uh, you don't want this to be like a sort of source of ignition especially when there's defined dust or um, a, a, a sort of like an explosive gas or some sort um, really to be honest it's, it's not it's not really good for those sort of systems so the two draw, main drawbacks are mechanical wear and not good for certain applications alternatively using a similar system there's a, a DC motor there's a thing called an EC motor so an EC motor is also known as electrically commentated so instead of using mechanical you know brushed system where you have to um, uh, obviously the two brushes connected onto the commentator you can do it electronically change the way the position of the uh, magnetic field changes with the windings like so so here we have a permanent magnet which would be in your um, rotor which would be a rotor itself and then you've got your stator which would be these windings here and as you can see here it's turning on the windings in sequence rotating this magnetic field and therefore rotating this, this, this magnet in the middle. So how is this done? So essentially you use your standard AC coming from the mains, which you, then you go for an AC to DC converter. Uh, as you can see, we are using three phase, that's for higher powered motors. You can use single phase and single phase versions as well. Uh, this then goes through a, a microprocessor system uh, which controls the circuit. It goes through this decoder here. So here's another representation of, doing, of this doing so. So you can see here all the all the wine has been energized in the sequence, which rotates magnetic field in turn, rotating this um, uh, rotor, which is a permanent magnet. So what are the benefits of such systems? Well, these EC motors, they're quite, they're, I wouldn't say they're new technology, but they're certainly coming into light nowadays, being that they are very highly high efficiency. I've uh, got a high efficiency uh, rating on a lot of these EC motors. Um, plus, they're very easy to control. You know, you can program them, you know, in, in a variety of ways to, to control the motor you've got. Um, is that, is, you're only limited by how it's been implemented by the manufacturer and what you can do with it. You, know, you can change the, the speed. Based on how quick these are, uh, the, the, the system switching, um, you can change how quick and the, uh, the motor ramps up, ramps down. You can change direction, you know, without needing to mechanically change or physically changing the, the cables itself. There's, there's a lot of this can be done remotely on a, on a system, um, and being that it's quite a smart device, it can also sort of like self monitor itself. Um, um, and also be very good in, in use in sort of like systems where BMS has been used or building management systems, you know, using uh, certain communication protocols, i.e. Modbus. But that, that's, that's, that's going down a different route, really. So we don't want to talk too much on that. But essentially, this can, is very uh, good for, to be used in systems where you've got a lot of BMS systems and you want to use um, a lot of control on, on, on the unit itself. And yet it's also... Um, uh, very efficient also so it's very good uh, high, high a lot of benefits on, on using these EC motors but uh, there is there is drawbacks to these as well so these these motors do require per magnets so rare, uh, rare earth magnets um, especially if you want high efficiency you want to use um, 
quite a, a quite rare earth magnets for it, so it can be quite expensive uh, for for, the, for that. Um, but also, being that there's electronics inside, there's also that added, added cost for um, the, the, the control circuit, control system. Um, but also being that there's permanent magnets inside and there's control systems. I mean, the control systems you don't have to have right next to the motor. This could be moved elsewhere, but this can't be really be used in high temperature situ situations um, because a lot of time when ma magnets, permanent magnets, hit uh, um, reach, reach high temperature or that you expose it to high temperature, it can remove or reduce the uh, the magnetic field of these magnets. You can actually completely remove a magnetic field from a magnet by exposing it to heat. So it's not really good for those applications. Um, being that it's also got all this electronics inside, we've got a added sort of higher complexity to the system. Um, and also you can't really remove that aspect to where you do need uh, this control system with it. So as much as it's very good for, you know, uh, efficiency, control, all these things, um, there's drawbacks where you have to use that control system and you can't use it in certain, certain applications. So this now leads on to AC motors. So similar to, I suppose, a DC motor, um, we do have a coil of wire in the same way. Um, Current flows in one direction at a, a given point of the uh, of the of the current uh, flowing. So essentially, it's, it's like so. So you've got a flow a current flowing in one direction at a given point of the waveform. Gives a, a magnetic field as so, and then just a magnet just to sort of represent what what the magnetic field is doing. Um, as it moves onto the lower half of the uh, waveform, the current flowing in another direction, and therefore the the field changes like so. But there's a benefit to this where we can actually use that to advantage. This change in magnetic fields being at like the change in the waveform, if we change the waveform and how quick it, uh, it changes, i.e. the frequency, you can actually change the uh, speed of which this magnetic field uh, rotates. And therefore, potentially, I'll go into more detail in a minute, the, uh, the, the, the speed at which the motor rotates also. So as you can see here, here's a uh, AC motors induction motor really, um, and this is a three phase system. So you've got the the pairing, the three pairing um, uh, windings like so. And you, as you can see here, this the, this these arrows are showing the or representing the rotating magnetic field, the strength fit, how it's rotating around the around the motor itself, in line with this um, this waveform. And you can always see being that this, these, these peak at the same points as the waveform itself, you can probably see how increasing that frequency can change the, the speed of this rotating magnetic field. But we'll go into some more detail that later on. So, and here we've got like a quick, quick video showing a, um, a ball bearing in a, in a motor, which showing this sort of rotating magnetic field. So from this, a little bit more mass here, unfortunately, but just just spare with. Um, you can figure out the synchronous speed of the, the motor itself, or give a, get a, get a, a rough estimate of what the motor's speed would be based on a few a few aspects of the motor itself. So here, the synchronous speed is equivalent to 120, which is just a constant to put it into um, RPM, and it's the supply frequency. So the frequency of this divided by the number of poles. Now a pole is related to a pair of uh, windings. Now in the three phase motor, what a two pole system would be, you got a pair of poles per phase. So essentially here, you've got a pair, a pair and a pair. So that's, that's three phases with, a, with only one set of pair in here. So that's seen as a two pole motor. You've got two poles, Per phase in that. Now that increased to four pole, six pole, eight pole, even ten pole. Um, 
but how does this how does this relate to the speed? So if you increase the number of poles in the in in, in a uh, in the motor, um, its speed, its RPM will actually reduce uh, uh, reduce. So I sort of explained by this this equation here. So the supply of frequency, the higher the frequency, the faster the motor can spin. But then divided by the number of poles, being that the number more, the higher or the more number more poles there are. The slower the speed would be. So um, we can go into an example, uh, which will be the next slide. We'll go into more into examples of such things. So like so. So we can quickly go through these. So speed of a two-pole motor. Well, given that frequency of our mains here in the UK is 50 hertz, we will just put 50 hertz as the supply frequency. And then you've got two poles, two pole motor divided by two, and then they give you the constant 120. And that was shown that the synchronous speed is 3000 RPM. Now, bear in mind, the synchronous speed is not the same as the actual speed. And I'll go in more detail later on, but essentially it's, it's, it's related to what the rotating magnetic field speed is. Now, if there's a rotor inside with a bit of load, that, that, uh, there is a little bit of slip there, so it might be slightly less than what you see there, but we're going more detail later on on that. So yeah, again, we'll do another one. So speed of four pole motor, again, 50 hertz, being that it's UK, divide by four, 120, that gives you 1500 RPM. As you can see here, you, you, you change, or you increase the number of poles by double, and that halves the RPM outside. But now what about if we change the frequency? So being that obviously the uh, the frequency has been at 50 hertz, but what if you change it to 60 hertz on the same pole or four pole system? Now this would increase the speed because you've got an increase in, 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 in frequency. So you've got this equation like so, so it increases it to 1800 RPM. Now you don't necessarily need to know and really memorize this equation if you want to figure out speed, there is on the on the motor D on the motor nameplate gives you the sort of the speed of what it is. But if you want to even calculate it before you get the motor, there is um, things on Google, you know, on, on search engines where you can essentially just search in simple speed tables and you get things like this. So the number of the pole and uh, at what frequency you've got 60 or 50 hertz and it gives you the given RPM like so signal speed. So now we know a bit more understanding on how the motor speed is changed on an AC motor. We can then figure out ways of how to speed control such systems. So obviously in the a, in a motor, the number of poles is fixed. Um, so really the only thing you can do with an AC induction motor is in change the frequency. Now, obviously it's given that um, the frequency in our mains is fixed. That's not changing, but you can use a thing called an inverter. An inverter can be used to change the frequency uh, supplies the motor. Um, either slow it down or speed it up, being like less than 50 hertz, or even increase it more than 50 hertz, which you don't tend to do. Um, but usually, it's good. It's good sort of representation of what we could do. Uh, lower than 50 hertz so if you increase it slowly or you want to just set a speed like I say half speed at like 25 hertz you can do using an inverter like so alternatively you can use speed controllers that change the voltage supplied to the motors but bear in mind this is only okay to certain motors so if you ever want to speed control a motor it's always uh, why is to speak to the motor manufacturer and ask them whether it can be speed controlled and if so what are the ways it can be speed controlled because usually it's one or two ways it's either via voltage or via frequency but then they're not interchangeable um, so if you for example if you try to change the speed of a motor which is to be can be changed by frequency but then you decide to use a uh, a varying voltage to the motor instead. This could Im uh, impact the, uh, the 
the, the motor itself. So essentially, if you try to reduce the voltage supply to the motor, being that there's a given current, uh, a power of the motor, it will try and increase the current. And the problem is if, you, if it tries to increase the current when you're reducing the voltage of the motor, this can then go past what the rating of the motor is and therefore even damage the motor itself. So it's always worth bearing in mind that you can't essentially speed control both frequency and voltage on a, on a, on a, on, a, on a single motor not really you it's always wise to speak to the manufacturer but most ac induction motors are controlled by frequency but it's always worth bearing in mind um on now from wherever you got the most from what can it be speed controlled by so that was the principal electrical motors so now we're going to move on to sort of the construction the operation of these motors So here we've got a squirrel cage induction motor. This is the AC motor we've been sort of speaking about in detail. So here, just to give you sort of a quick aspect of, of such motor, um, we've got this sort of terminal box here. Now, some of these some of these motors can have loose leads, so you don't have to have a terminal box that leads coming out of the motor itself, which in the application here at Woods, we tend to use more of so we can have the hour turn box on the ducting of them of the uh, of our, our our systems rather than um, directly on the motor like so um you've got the stator this is your rotor and the shaft itself um this one here is shown as a foot mounted motor there's there is different types of uh, mounting there's also pad mounting which is uh, equal spacing from up here and down here like so but we go into more detail on, on mounting later on. We've got, we've got some uh, pictures to show on that. Um, and then you've got bearings. Bearings is quite important to, to sort of like uh, to the single motor and its life 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 um, uh, stage. There's two types that tend to be ones where you need to reload relubricate, and there's ones where they tend to be fixed for life. Um, but like yeah, again, I'll go in more detail later on in this in this session. Um, and then here you've got a fan. This fan is used to cool the motor while it's running. So this this fan is actually put onto the shaft of the rotor itself. So as the rotor is rotating, it rotates the fan and cools the motor down itself. Now, obviously, in our application, we have this massive, large actual fan on the end of this, which is basically doing the same thing. So when we have these motors, we tend to remove such fans and systems from, from the motor itself because we've got this massive fan here cooling the system actually cooling more efficiently than the fan here um, and that's also another reason why we want to get rid of this this tunnel box because we've got this massive fan producing their flow over the motor or coming come back from over the motor and having obstacles like terminal boxes or like in the system can actually cause resistance in our in our systems and we so we tend to move them for our application and fans but that's sort of like a quick quick overview of uh, induction motor so going into the detail of the motor connections so in the in induction motors there's two ways you can really connect to the, uh, the motor there's either delta or star now here you've got the delta connection or star or or known also known as y connection um here you've got a slight diagram showing how it's connected up now in 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 the terminal box uh either on the inducting or on the motor itself and you would see there's there's six usually six cables that come out and that represents the the three phase of the three windings so you've got three windings um and the six connections. So you've got a, uh, a connection for each end of each winding, each of the three windings. So there's six overall. Now you've got these letters, numbers. Now how they relate to the winds is, is like so. So you've got U, V, and W. Now the the same letter refers to the same winding. So U1 and U2. That's one. Uh, that's both ends of one winding. The same with v1 v2 
W on W2. Now in a, uh, a terminal box, it's actually been um, already connected up, associated like this. So you've got a, uh, one side of W going to there, one side of U going there, et cetera, et cetera, like so. Now it's usually the same format in each motor, each connection uh, or each terminal box. Now, the way you connect it up in Delta and in Star is like so. So you tend to have these, uh, you just short the connection between these two, these two and these two for Delta, or along the top here, or in along the bottom like it is shown here, either or, um, to do it in Star. And then you've got your L1, L2 and L3 coming in like so. Now, what is the difference between Delta and Star? How is that? change the characteristics of the motor itself and then how way it performs well when you run it in delta delta you tend to run a few example example so uh, 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 most motors run in delta full speed at say 400 volts now this is fine you run it up straight in that direct to line there's no sort of start methods no inverters it's purely directly on on, on the three phase mains so when you do that there is this massive starting current and when you're running at the full speed 400 volt in delta you can get this massive starting current and this starting current as shown on by this graph here can be up to six times yeah the, the normal operating current now this is okay to the motor, this is fine for the motor, but if your system's not um, ready or expecting this sudden inflow, or this flow of, of current, um, it, it, it can either like trip fuses or chip, trip, trip uh, contactors or anything like that. It could trip certain things in, in the system and, and cause issues with, with the system. So sometimes you want to start it up at a lower current. And the way to do that can be starting up the motor and start using the same voltage now starting up and start you start up at a lower a lower current like so uh, it could be up to two times normal operating current and as that increases the speed you get to a point but unfortunately star you can't run at full speed at the same voltage what deltas usually run at so you want to run a motor at star you tend to need to increase the voltage but for this system if you want to just just use it as a starting method you can use it at 400 volts also or depending on the system but for this example 400 volts and then you want to you know when it gets to about 80 percent running speed switch over to delta and you can use this via contacts as uh, like and doing this you're going to get a lower overall starting current which will probably save us your system or even you know saves the the, the hassle of getting the, the right equipment to overcome this current which you've got here as your starting current um, and how this associates with torque so here we've got your two lines of torque so essentially in um, in delta you've got a higher torque and this higher torque relates also with the higher current so the higher torque which which helps with getting up to speed quick as also running at the uh, running at the running speed but in star it's a lower torque yes it gives a lower current which is good but unfortunately means you can't necessarily get up to full running speed so another alternative is that okay the motor might be running at 400 volts in delta or you can run at in star but at like 600 plus volts um but that's just an example you tend to run start a higher voltage if you want to run it, it purely in star but you tend to use star as like a way of starting methods for for running in delta now this is mainly for motors which tend to have six leads coming out bear in mind some motors already have three leads coming out because they would be um, connected or winded up in a certain way ready for either in delta or star and that's all needs to be determined based on the uh, manufacturer themselves but we've gone into too much detail now so We'll carry on from there. Um, probably something which is probably more relatable going into the uh, nameplate itself. So the nameplate, this is where it's worth to sort of identifying aspects of this and how you can get an understanding where what what to to get from uh, when when you're looking at the motors and what to understand what you need to look for. So here, 
this is a basic um, or like a example of a WEG motor. So here we've got shown three phase. So it's a three phase motor and you've got 250, which is the frame size. You're going to go in more detail how you determine frame size going later on. Uh, and it's a, a, a short, medium fr uh, frame size and length. And then you've got four, that refers to the amount of poles. That's a four pole motor. It's an IP55, which is ingress protection. I'll go in more detail later on on what that means. Uh, insulation class H, you go in more detail later on. Uh, the, that's relating to sort of the temperature which the windings can work at um, based on it, based on its uh, insulation. Um, and then read really main information here, you've got running at 40 degrees Celsius, or this motor is also known as being a high temperature motor that you can run at 300 degrees Celsius for no more than really two hours. Then you go into more detail. So here you've got uh, the, the motor part number for WEG. And then you've got the, uh, the the bulk of information here. So here are your different ways of operating the motor. So you can run it at delta at these given voltages at this given frequency. So these top three being at 50 hertz, you can run it at 400 volt delta, 50 hertz, and that gives you this arc, this uh, uh, given um, uh, speed. And this is the actual speed. This is where going back to how we had a single speed and actual speed. This is the actual speed um, based on the full load current, which is given here, being that it's, if it's running at this given 75 kilowatt motor. Um, and here you've got two separate um, uh, current ratings. So this is the uh, both full load current, but you've got 400 volts at, and this will be at 135 amps being your full load current. But if you've got run it, we decide to run it in star. Here, what I was saying before, you want to run and start at a higher voltage to still run at the same uh, same same power, same speed to get enough torque to do the, the to run the motor. Um, you end up running at a lower current but a higher voltage. And as you probably remember before, this relates to power. So power is a relationship between voltage and current. Then you've got power factor, then you've got efficiency. So power factor, we won't go into too much detail on that. That's that gives you especially how, how uh, sort of relationship between um actual and reactive power but we're going we can't we won't go into too much detail on that uh it's not necessary so we've got also then the ec uh, the ie rating which is the efficiency rating yeah, again more detail of that later on what that refers to this one's the ie1 goes ie2 ie3 but i'll go into more detail later on and then the associated efficiency percentage so these are the loads so 100 percent load 75 percent load 50 percent load here's your efficiency percentage so 93 percent efficiency or 93.1 percent let's say and then here at the bottom left hand corner this is details of the bearings which i mentioned before so you've got two sets of bearings one at the front and the back of the motor itself the types of bearings and then you've got uh sometimes it gives you information on the lubrication as well here we've got the two types of connections so the delta and star how it how it's done so it gives you information on how it's done um and that's really all you need to know for this i mean you've got the weight down here um but relating this all back to this the uh, actual speed here um as you can see there is a change to you know it depending on 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 the on which which one you choose to use a uh, different voltage or different currents um the, it changes in its rpm now we can quickly just discuss how we've done before relating to this example with the uh, synchronous speed, how to calculate that. So do have a quick calculate here. We can sort of do this as a working example together. So we know this is a four pole motor and we've got the frequency here. So if we want to say run it at 400 volts um, at 50 hertz, so we use, the, we use this line here. So 50 hertz, so we know the equation being 120, and you want to times the uh, frequency, which is 50 hertz, and you want to divide that by the four. Now that is your synchronous speed. Now, 
bear in mind, like I said before, the single speed is the rotating magnetic field speed. Now, as you can see here, it's different from that to the actual speed shown here, 1479, which is what difference to like what, 21 RPM, yeah. Uh, and that's your slip. So the reason why there is a bit of slip is because the load, so this is based on the load. The increasing load can also reduce the speed at which you can rotate. But this is your rotating magnetic field, and that's your actual rotating uh, rotor, essentially, speed. Um, that's really just the reason why you want to do this is to give you a sort of an example of what the motor speed could run at. Now, the, how this relates to uh, um, how you can determine actual speed is based on the motor, motor manufacturer. They give you the, the term slip or determine actual speed and you go via uh, the, motor, the motor manufacturer's description of that. But you can give if you want to find out what type of motor you want, what pulse speed, what frequency um, for a given speed, then you can use this equation to do so to give you sort of a, a, a rough estimate of what speed your motor is looking to run at. Right, so we'll move on. So here, there's also another aspect to, to these uh, uh, mo um, induction motors is there's also a two speed type. So there's two speed motors. Now here is a, a thing called a pole change where as you can see here, the six pole and a four pole within the same motor. Depending how you connect it up, you can connect it up to one set of windings in the motor, which would be a six pole or another set of windings, which would be associated with a four pole motor. Now these obviously change in poles or change the speeds. Like I said before, we can we can change the poles to change the speed, but bear in mind this is a fixed entity. And being that you can change this, it's only changing between only two sets, which are six pole and four pole motor. Alternatively, you got this type, which is known as like a dual wound motor. Now these dual wound motors work in a similar way. Change you can change in poles. You've got a four to two pole motor. But with a pull change motor like so, one set of windings is redundant while the other one's been used. This one, it, it, it uh, utilizes both windings at the same time um, in two different ways. And you can see how it's been connected like so down here. So here you've got the two different type of, of windings connected up for the L1, 2, 3, for these two low speed, high speed, or we've got low speed, high speed, slightly different in a dual round like so. That's just give you a super, quite a little a quick touch on the two speed motors. Um, right, so now we're going to move on to sort of starting methods when it comes to these uh, induction motors. So we touched on it before a little bit. We've we've touched a little bit on the star delta using that as a way of starting. We'll go into more detail again on that. Um, but also there's the standard sort of direct line where you just connect the motor straight up to your three phase mains straight on. Use an isolator to turn it on and off. Um, but then we've got some bits here about soft starters and a bit more information about using uh, the, the, these these inverter drives. So direct to line, um, when you start it up, you tend to use about five to even seven times starting current, um, or starting current is five to seven times more than the the, the full load current. Uh, that's usually what you, that's, it's the standard normally around that sort of figure. Um, then you've got star and delta. So this is where I was talking to you before, where you start the motor and star, and then it speeds up to about 75, 80% speed. Then you switch to delta, and this uses the lowest start and current, as you can see here, up to three to four times, which is pretty good. You know, it's a reduction of, of how, how, how much the current's been uh, flowing to the motor, as you can see here. Uh, graph of the direct nine, star, delta, a little flick here, but. Not, not to worry about that side. Um, certainly not not for as long as what the direct online would be for the start and current. And then you've got soft star. Now soft star, um, that's something we haven't touched on um, at all today. So this uses a, a thing called thyristor pair, um, and it basically it allows a section of the waveform to come through to the motor a little bit at a time. So at the beginning we've got a little bit of each waveform coming through and as the motor speeds up it lets more and more of the waveform come through 
slowly introducing the current coming through um, uh, until it fit, hits full speed. And as you can see here, it slowly lets the current through and it gets to the full waveform and then it's, it, it, uh, it carries on speeding up until it hits the full speed like so. So that's a pretty good method as well to speed up the motor. Alternatively, lastly, the, the frequency drive. Now the frequency drive is probably the, 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 the better way, uh, the most uh, efficient way when it comes to reducing the start current. Um, and that, the reason why it's not shown on here as well is because the, the, the inverter drive, you can speed up the frequency. Now the frequency can be used to slowly increase, and this is what I was talking about, uh, uh, start up time. As you increase the frequency, you can increase the speed. Now on inverter drives, you can program them to slowly increase at any given speed. So you can you know, set a time of like speed up in 40 seconds or even speed up in a minute. It depends on your system, how you want to do it. Obviously, the slower you start it up, the less of this um, start current there will be. So this is probably the best method for if you want to reduce your start and current method, um, uh, the increase of your start and current. Right, so that's all the aspects of the AC motors. So here we've got a little bit on a touch on the EC motor side. So the EC motors, there's tends to be uh, um, some controls on a lot uh, on some given EC motors. A lot of them more or less the same than this, where you have uh, start. So we can start on sort of the power. So you've got the cap power cable coming in, and you've got the control cable. And this control cable is what's used to go to the, the motor itself. So the control side of the motor itself can either be set uh, connected on the back of the motor, or it could be separated. So it'd be in say in a fan application, it could be motors inside the uh, ducting, and you can have the control system on the outside of the ducting itself. Um, we're inside that, you can have dip switches, and these switches can be used to speed up and speed down the motor. Um, you can speed them up to uh, a given speed, and that could be locally um, sped up to, to a given speed. And then you can set, have that as a set speed. You can turn off the motor, turn it on, and it always comes to that set speed. Alternatively, you can change the way you do your, your speed adjustment to change the reference. And you can do that locally, which is by these buttons, or you can do it remotely. And this could be by a zero to 10 volt signal going to your motor. Now this you can use via like a, a, a pot or some sort of speed control, which is separated somewhere down the line. Um, you can have elsewhere in your like a control cabinet, you can speed it up and do it separately away from the fan itself. Separately, you can also do a change the, the rotation direction. So clockwise and anti-clockwise. Now this is simply done by a switch or in software, these these, these motors, you, like I say, you can connect via uh, the RS485 inside and connect it via a PC program where you could be the other side of the inside the world and you can control, you know, a, a set speed or you can change the direction without needing to do any physical work at all. Um, so there's always that side of it. Plus, there's also usually a, a diagnosis stick um, LED telling you if there's a fault. Uh, usually, sometimes it even flashes to give you a reason, like a, a code to associate it to with the ONM manual. Um, that's that's really it to sort of show on the aspect of the easy motor. Um, but that's it for that section. So <clears throat> now we we'll move on to the motor features. Things to consider going on to that. So. First of all, going back to how we were talking about on these induction motors, how they're mounted, there's different ways that these motors can be mounted. So I'll put them up on there. So here you've got what we saw before, which was a foot mounted motor. Now these foot mounted motors, um, uh, they're, they're, you know, we tend to, for, for our application, we have a, a platform which they can sit on. Uh, alternatively, or preferably in our application, that's all actual fans, um, we tend to use pads where you've got equal, um, we've got these these four arms connected to each section of the motor, that's so. And these tend to be the two most commonly used in our applications. But 
going from that, there's also two other there's other types going forward as well of of, of how you can mount these motors. There's C flange and D flange, and this is purely mounted on on the actual flange itself. Where you've got a smaller type and a larger type. We sometimes use those on certain on, on special specific applications, mainly when it comes to the sort of maybe centrifugal fans or or like or some of our systems. But this sort of gives you an example of all the different types. Uh, but there is codes associated with these. So if you want to make sure that you've got the same mounting for the same motor, you go by these codes here. So you've got the B14 for the C flange, B5D, and you've got B3 foot and uh, B30 for pad. <clears throat> now, in more, I say more modern motors. So a lot of, especially EC motors and some other, uh, some applications, some designs have been changed so that uh, these motors have given T slots. On, on the on the mounting on the, the casing itself so that you can change either if you have a pad or you can even change it to foot so you can use two of these um, facing here uh, t-mounts to then put foot uh, feet on them instead uh, so you could potentially even change it from a pad to a foot but this is only on given designs not all motors have this uh, the majority of motors still don't have that but that's like a new design i've noticed and some motors which are sort of implementing that going down the line Now frame sizes. Now this is what we quickly touched up on that, uh, touched on on the uh, nameplate itself. So the frame size is determined by the uh, the outer uh, the distance from the outer casing, from this uh, circumstance that even the foot to the central uh, the center of the, uh, the the shaft itself, and it's in millimeters. So um, the height from here could be 71 millimeters, which gives you yeah a frame size of 71. These sort of give yeah, the examples 80, 90, 100, 112. And then this is associated with also in relation to sort of almost power or even efficiency. So the higher the power, the higher the efficiency, sometimes even the, 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 the frame size also increases along with that. Um, obviously, the increase in frame size increases the, the size of the motor and therefore the obstruction, say, in our application with bands. Um, increases the, uh, the, the how much resistance of the airflow can go through. But yeah, again, there's, there's, there's the relationship between also the metal, the size of the motor and the power. So um, usually you have to get, if you want a high power motor, as you say, like a 90 kilowatt motor, uh, there won't be anything which you can't really get that in an 80 frame motor. And likewise, usually in a 0 0.75 or 750, what motor you won't get like a frame size of that power motor in like a 280 frame uh, be a lot, a lot larger but sometimes also efficiency can affect the motor as well if you want to increase the efficiency of a motor say you've got a uh, and this is where i was talking about ie1 ie2 ie3 the higher the number is usually associated with a higher efficiency yeah again i'll talk about more detail later on later on on this session um but Usually, with the increased efficiency, is associated with the amount of copper within the motor. The more copper used, it can increase the, uh, the, the efficiency uh, due to the reduced in um, reduction in, in temperature and uh, just generally better magnetic field being produced in, in, inside the motor. And in turn, this increases the frame size of the motor as well. Then move on to IP rating. So this is the ingress protection I was talking to you about before. So IP, central ingress protection. Then you've got the, the two numbers. The two numbers, the left number being associated with dust protection and the right number is associated with liquid protection. So for this system, uh, for this uh, uh, system, you've got 65. So IP65 would be um, total protection to get dust. And then good protection against water jets, but not no protections against sort of heavy seas or complete, you know, immersion or definite immersion of the motor itself. So this sort of gives you an understanding of how that number associates with uh, the protection of the motor. So most motors really tend to be like 55, maybe 65, or even 66 in some cases, maybe more depending on the application, but. A lot of motors I've been seeing usually about 55, 56. Um, 
but again, you know, going to ATEX motors might increase a little bit more. But that's sort of how it associates with with, with motors and what ingress aggression protection relates to. So now moving on to now this is something which I haven't touched on is drain plugs. Now motors when they heat up and cool down it can cause condensation not only externally but internally as well on the casing and on the rotor so they they the most motors have <coughs> drain plugs to sort of drain this uh, liquid coming out so obviously these droplets build up and then cause um, uh, water droplets to then sort of sit at the bottom of the motor and every so often you need to take these drain plugs out to let water uh, flow out now you need to associate this with your obviously the O&M of the, of the motor they might suggest it certain application or certain times you need to check on this but it all depends on how you're using the motor and where it's been associated with and how um how you're using it if you're using it all the time or you constantly turn it up and down and usually when you heat it up and cool it down that's when uh, if you keep doing that that's when it usually builds up on condensation now bear in mind this only is used for standard you know even high temperature motors uh, but not ATEX, ATEX and hazardous area motors. They don't tend to have that um, associated with them. Um, now, there's ways of preventing condensation. There's another way we can, instead of obviously reducing, removing the uh, condensation, you can actually reduce how it, how much condensation's happened. And one thing could be using heaters. So some motors have heaters embedded in the wind themselves, uh, which should be constantly on, even when the motor's not running. And this sort of prevents any sort of condensation heat uh, build up as as the motor slow down, cools down. It's not actually cooling down if you've got the heaters on, and therefore condensation doesn't build up. So that's one way of preventing that. You can get heaters for these motors. That sort of gives you some examples there. Some frame size, wattages, and number of heaters tend to be associated with that. Alternatively, now. The reason why you want to get rid of the condensation, uh, really, the liquid can actually cause um, corrosion of the var of the varnish or even uh, the sort of protected layer of the uh, um, of the wine themselves. So, alternatively, so you do want to get rid of that. But alternatively, you can just increase or put special varnishes on. So, uh, a thing called tropicalization, where you can actually increase. Uh, or change how much varnish has been used on have been put on the motor uh, on on the winders themselves to help stop any corrosion build up uh, within the within the motor itself. So this is one thing you can actually ask for if you want to sort of like reduce how much corrosion has been happening due to uh, uh, the, the added condensation of of of, of uh, water build up. Uh, the, other way, the other way of obviously reducing the amount of corrosion is to use these special varnishes. So there's two ways of preventing issues there when it comes to condensation. So moving on to now wine insulation. This is what I was talking about before on the name plate where you had uh, insulation class and it showed as H. This is associated with the, the temperature or the maximum winding temperature of the motor. So the higher the letter or the, the further the letter is down, down the uh, alphabet, uh, usually is associated with a higher uh, maximum winding temperature. Um, so this is sort of gives you some information here. So the height, as you can see here, B, F, H, give you these given sort of temperatures here. But let's just give you a quick, quick example of that that side of it. <clears throat> now we're going to sort of more the thermal protection. So thermal protection is this. It comes with two types. So there's uh, thermostats and it's the misters. Now. Most motors tend to be used with thermistors, which I've been seeing, uh, especially with the motors we tend to use with, with our systems, but they can be used with thermostats. Now, obviously, depending which one you use, depends on how your control system works. So if you want a control system where it, it either shuts down the motor or associates with the motor itself, whether it, uh, if a given temperature is given, uh, then the motor shuts down. You need to determine that based on the, obviously the thermal protection that's been put on to the motor itself. So problem with this is most motors tend to be coming with a given uh, uh, type of thermal protection. So with some, a lot of motors, if they come with the misses, you can't tend to pick and choose and say, oh, I want a, th a thermostat instead. 
um, most motors tend to be a given thermal protection. You can't really change that. Um, but what is the difference between the two? So therm thermistors, they tend to be a, a type of resistor and the resistant changes with temperature. So as you can see by this graph, resistance changes with temperature. So the resistance changes a little bit until it hits a higher temperature and the resistance changes a lot. Uh, and then you can associate that with uh, your given control system of you know whether you shut it down at a certain temperature or not. Alternatively, is a thermostat. A thermostat is purely just a, 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 a basically a switch, essentially internal switch which opens and closes depending on the temperature. So uh, once it hits a certain temperature, there's there's two uh, two metal plates which tend to open up when it gets to a certain temperature, and there's the, the connection between the two lines uh, disconnects. And some some motors tend to use it as sort of like, uh, especially single phase motors, they tend to have a line going through that thermostat into the motor, into the supply of the motor, so that when the temperature hits a certain point, the actual supply to the motor is actually uh, disconnected. But that's usually associated with uh, single phase motors. But some three phase motors might have thermostats, and you can use that in our in your control system. But it's always better and worth in mind if you want to use therm thermal protection in your system, you need to know which type has been used with. Your, your your motor. So now moving on to efficiency uh, legislation. So this is referring to the IE rating I was talking to you about earlier. So you've got associated uh, numbers with IE rating. This is regulations um, for, for efficiency. So IE one, two, three, four, and the higher number, the higher the, the efficiency of the motor. Now, most of the induction motors tend to be, I mean, some you know, uh, can be IE1, uh, a lot of them usually IE2 or even IE3, and especially as we're getting more of a, going into more, um, uh, want to be more environment, more environmentally friendly, we want to have a high efficient motor. So a lot of our motors here uh, would, we tend to start to head towards IE3 motors rather than keeping with IE1 or IE2, uh, especially to keep up with regulations, especially in the EU. Um, now with EC motors, EC motors tend to be, being at the higher efficiency, they tend to be IE3, IE4, or even some some motors, like so in other permanent magnet motors, are going up to even IE5. Um, obviously there's added cost of that and other 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 things going with that. But essentially, just give you, yeah, just to give an example of how 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 that associates so IE, IE, IE1 being the lowest, and then as you go up in numbers, the higher efficiency. Um, but as you can see by this graph, this is only associates this associates with power as well. So usually the higher power motors tend to be a very high efficiency in percentage in our, in order to become uh, a higher uh, uh, sort of uh, efficiency rating essentially. So I suppose a quick quick example on here. So um, at a say one kilowatt motor. This is based on the four pole 50 hertz this, uh, that this graph is on. Uh, you probably need to be about what? It's about 87% efficiency in order, in order to be an IE4. Uh, but if you want to be an IE4 on a, what is probably about 10, 10 kilowatt, yeah, 10 kilowatt motor, you probably, you need to be about 93%. So as you can see here, the higher uh, the power, the higher the more efficiency the motor needs to be in order to hit that ratings. And then obviously you probably need to know this in order to understand, um, obviously to hit certain regulations either in your system or wherever this is going to be installed. So that, that's 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 it. That's that's the session. That's all done. So that that we've now covered it all. So we we we've, we've covered certain aspects. We've covered it now. We've we've covered the basics of electrical power. The difference between AC DC, difference between single and three phase, um, and also the basics of electrical motors. So the pros and cons of both AC and DC motors, uh, the basics of induction and EC motors, uh, of running them, at, um, just running the motor themselves, um, and how to work out certain synchronous motors and how 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 it works, how you work out and how to find it out the synchronous speed of the motor. Also. The basics of constructions. We've gone on to that. We've gone to the nameplates, understand that, the operations of induction motors, the, the starting methods of induction motors, and the operations and generic, generic controls of the EC motors as well, um, as well as a bit of some of the basic, the basic features of electric motors also. 
So now that sort of concludes our session today.